Well, thank you all for uh, your patience uh, waiting for the second to last presentation. Uh, so Leo Xu will be presenting uh, his work on development of a low-cost human-based dissolved oxygen sensor with anti-biofoul encoding for water monitoring. Uh, Leo is from McNass University. In so, hello everyone. I'm Leo. Uh, thank you for the introduction. So I'm going to talk about uh, the top oxygen sensor we make available. So first, this is my motivation. As you can see in this figure, half of our world is now facing drinking water crisis. Uh, it depends on so so it's indicated by different color. The red color means the situation is really bad in this area. Yellow colors means it's moderated. And blue means it's still fine. Although the other half is still fine. If it's going from bad to worse, eventually this will become a global problem and affect all of us. There are three main factors that cause this drinking water crisis. The population growth, the climate change, and the most important one, the pollution from daily human behavior, like the industrial destruction, urban uh, agriculture runoff, and the urban wastewater. Actually, most of this pollution are treatable. However, because of the lack of online water monitoring system, we can only notice the pollution until it causes severe problems. Like you can see in these two figures, the acrylic element dye or the algae bloom, which are also treatable, but it will cost you lots of money and spend a long period of time. So we need an online water monitoring system by why choosing oxygen as our target, because from environmental engineering point of view, dissolved oxygen is used as an indicator for all kinds of pollution. Let me take ammonia as an example. So when ammonia going to the water, it will start degrading biologically or chemically to nitrite and nitrate. This process consumes oxygen. So if we can continuously monitoring the dissolved oxygen concentration, we can notice immediately when the ammonia starts damaging our water, which also works for most of other pollutants. So that's why we choose the oxygen as our target. But why we're not doing now? What's the challenge? The most challenge is because of money. It's not only because the dissolved oxygen sensor itself is expensive because they use a complicated um, optical design or the expensive material they use that I will talk into detail later on. But also because the maintenance cost is huge. The maintenance mainly because of the biofouling happen on our sensor. The biofouling happens right after you put your sensor into the water. So the protein starts absorb. Then after a minute or so, the bacteria and cells start absorb on it. Then the uh, animals start growing on top of it. So after one or two weeks, this is how your sample look like. Uh, sorry, your your sensor look like. So we have to pick it up from water, clean it, and make it back to work. So which is okay for doing one spot. Uh, sensing, but imagine you want to do a monitoring in a big water system like Lake Ontario. Here's where we are, and here's how big Lake Ontario is. What currently Canada government do is they have one sensor doing 80 measurements and have two to four times of maintenance per month to get a monthly data, which is less than sufficient. Ideally, what we want is the hourly data. In order to do so, we have to have an 80 expensive sensor do a 54,600 times of measurement and doing a 320 times of maintenance, which will cost you lots of money and our government, of course, not supporting that. So if we can low cost our sensor and also increase the lifetime, probably we can overcome these challenges. On top of that, we also want our sensor can collect data automatically and also have a sufficient sensitivity. So. We have to find a way to sensing our dissolved oxygen. There are three typical ways for dissolved oxygen sensing: the titration method, optical method, and electrochemical method. First, this is the titration method. By following this series of chemical reaction, the dissolved oxygen concentration can be indicated when iodine indicator changes color. This method is really precise. However, because of a complicated chemical reaction. It, that require well trained people to do that, and also the chemical consumption make this method become really expensive. The second one is an optical method. This is typically how it looks like. You have a membrane that is fluorescent and dissolved oxygen sensitive. When you're shining a light on it, you will produce fluorescence that can be detected by the detector underneath of here. 
When the dissolved oxygen go in and contact this sink field, it will cause the quenching effect, and the quenching intensity is proportional to the dissolved oxygen concentration. This master is really sensitive, also has a very quick response time. However, because of this complicated optical uh, design, so this cost is really high, and also because the sample directly contact the sink field, the biofalling is almost inevitable. The third one is the electrochemical sensor. This is typically how it looks like. We have a platinum working electrode and silver silver chloride counter electrode and a gas permeable membranes underneath of it to prevent the interference go in and contact the working electrode. When the dissolved oxygen go in, it will contact the platinum and platinum used as a catalyst to trigger the oxygen reduction reaction, which produce current and the dissolved oxygen concentration can be calculated by this equation. <coughs> so, the, this method is really simple. That's why the cost of this is the lowest among the three methods. However, because you use platinum as the catalyst, the cost is still a little bit high. And also, the biofalling may happen on top of our sensor. However, if we can, if we can solve these two challenges, our uh, dissolved oxygen sensor making by electrochemical way will be our best solution. In order to do so, first, we want to find an alternative of <coughs> platinum. By taking the advantages of uh, fuel cell research, there's a whole bunch of alternatives have been well studied because oxygen reduction reaction is their anal reaction that is very important. Among all those alternative material, Parfrain is one of the very unique ones because of low cost and high efficiency. Here I list some of the parfrain and drop them by the exchanging current density, which means if we put the same amount of material inside of the oxygen, how much current it will produce. And of course, the higher, the better. That's why I choose iron parfrain as my soft oxygen sensitive material. So conventionally, people use this layer by layer synthesized method to immobilize parfrain onto the electrode. Uh, so first we have a stable layer solution and iron parfrain solution. We first dip it into stable solution, then iron parfrain solution. By repeat doing so, because of the charge attraction, then we will get a fully coverage, which is really time consuming and we don't want to do that. Therefore, we choose a heming, one of the iron parfrain that has two carboxyl groups underneath of it that if we provide a sufficient potential, this double bond will break and polymerize, and then we can cover our electrode by a single step. By doing so, we can actually get a oxygen reduction reaction picked here, if you can see, so at minus 0.7 volt. Uh, however, the pick's really small because this material is low conductivity. Therefore, even if it triggers oxygen reduction reaction, the current transfer from the material to the electrode rate is pretty low. Therefore, limited the oxygen reduction reaction efficiency. In order to overcome this challenge, we incorporated a common low-cost uh, conductive polymer, polypyro, to make a copolymerized uh, sensor. In, by doing so, we can increase the oxygen reduction reaction current like you can see here in the dot line. So we find the increasing conductivity is actually help. And then that's why we choose the most conductive material, silver, to incorporate together to make our final dissolved oxygen sensor. By doing so, you can see our, our uh, oxygen reduction reaction current is further increased, as well as it shows a clearly picked. So by doing so, we can get a sensor that has a linear relationship between the dissolved oxygen concentration and the current density read. And the sensitivity is defined by the slope of this linear relationship. Uh, by doing different kind of parameter change, like the duration of copolymerization or the potential of copolymerization, then we find out at 0.9 volt for copolymerization for 100 seconds give us the best sensitivity. That's why we choose this one to synthesize our dissolved oxygen sensor. So now we have the sensitivity. 
But we want to increase our selectivity as well. If you remember, I talked earlier on, there's a gas permeable membrane underneath of the, underneath of the electrode to prevent any interference going. If we don't do that, our sensor will have around 80% to 30% of bounce current produced by the common interference like nitrate and phosphate. So we choose our membrane to cover on top of it. By covered PMS membranes on our sensor, we can reduce the bulk current to lower than 10%, which is, I believe, because of the sensor itself. However, uh, why we choose PDMS is because the gas permeability of the membrane is directly related to our sensitivity. If we can get high gas permeability, then we will get high sensitivity. Therefore, instead of using conventional Teflon membranes, we use PDMS membrane that has a way higher gas permeability. By a simulation, then we find out our sensitivity or signal intensity can be increased 10 parts, five times higher. However, the biofouling happens even faster on the PDMS surfaces because it's hydrophobic nature. You can see on this figure, after 20 minutes, if we put our PDMS into the protein-rich environment, it will cover totally by protein. And eventually, our sensor will look like this, covered by all the organic matter, and our target cannot go in to trigger the oxygen reduction reaction. So this is how we do it for the biofouling test. This is our fresh sensor. It looks pretty straight, uh, and the sensitivities look like this. After seven days of this accelerated biofouling process, it means we put our sensor into a nutrient-rich solution, so the biofilm grow faster. After seven days of that, you can see our sensor lost all its sensitivity. By alter, for alter that, we introduce a common anti-folding agent, polyethylene glycol, to grafting on top of our PDMS. By doing so, we can prevent the biofouling and maintain our sensitivities after seven days of this anti-accelerated uh, biofouling process. Uh, this is a lifetime test of my sensor. Uh, this DO concentration you can read from the right hand side is read by the optical sensor that is commercial available. So ideally we want our sensor to follow the same trend of it but not decrease it. So as you can see, if we cover it by pure PDMS, it will lose its, uh, its signal intensity over one day. However, if we cover it by PG graphing PDMS, it will maintain its sensitivity after 21 days, even at the accelerated biofouling environment. I will conclude it first, then I'll compare it. So first, uh, our automatic data collection can be satisfied by the electrochemical sensing. Our low cost effect can be satisfied by the polyheming replacement to the plaquen, and our reliable sensitivity can be satisfied by the copolymerization method as well as the PDMS membrane replacement. A long time stability can be satisfied by a PEG modification. And this is a comparison between my sensor and the commercial available sensor. As you can see, the cost is lower, the lifetime is longer. Although the sensitivity is lower because we use cheaper material, this is still sufficient for doing the environmental water sensing. So I would like to thank ANSERC for funding, thank all my supervisor and my lab mate for their great help, and would like to thank you for your attention, and I'm willing to take some of the questions.